lecture 21 in our series and today we're continuing with the Feynman rules for fermions. So last uh, video we obtained these uh, Feynman rules uh, in, mom in, in position space in Euclidean space-time and today we're going to translate those to momentum space and to Minkowski. Right, so essentially the very end of the last video we got these uh, these rules here. Of course, these are to be understood as plugged within this bigger set of rules for, for building Feynman diagrams. Right? You have to integrate over all the vertices, all the conservations and all of that. Right? And, and these are just the, the new parts for uh, Yukawa theory, right? So the scalar one that we already knew, we're using this new symbol for it now just dash lines for for scalar lines and uh, this is the new propagator for fermions right? besides there's uh, the interaction that we have shown that this is a Yukawa interaction interaction that involves two fermions and a scalar right with a coupling G so that's the rule for that and we have shown that when you have closed loops for fermions that generates uh, overall minus one sign for each loop, which you need to multiplicate in your diagram. Right? Now, translating these to Minkowski and to momentum space is pretty easy. Right? This guy does not depend on position nor on momentum, so it only gets an I here, as I already have shown. So the rule in Minkowski space is just this. Right? There's no different difference between position and momentum space. Right? As for the propagators, I already have them written here right, in Euclidean space. So all I have to do is rotate them to Minkowski, which I have already shown for both. right, Both the scalar, back when we were doing the scalar field, and the fermion uh, on the last video. Right? So here they are already rotated to Minkowski. Notice that in momentum space, it continues to be true that I have to be careful with the direction of the propagator because CP is here and so the sign of P will change depending if the momentum is going one way or another which is not true here. Also uh, I, I changed the notation a bit to give more generality right so now I'm allowing the mass of the scalar to be different from different from the mass of the, the fermion because I mean they don't have to be the same right this is uh, more general. And this rule uh, continues to be the same, right? It doesn't matter if you are in position or, or momentum space, the whole logic of how you get this minus one is the same. So that's the translation to momentum space and Minkowski. Now, why am I going to Minkowski? Because I want Feynman rules for my physical final state, right? That's why you have to come back to Minkowski right uh, near the end of these calculations. Hmm? The point now is that I have to deal with the external legs. Right? If you remember, there's two ways of doing it. Right? At least I did it two, in two ways for the scalar case. One was to take the green function in momentum space, do a Fourier transform, and then apply L at Z reduction formula. Right, to amputate these external legs, right, to remove the external propagators and see uh, what kind of expression I, I would get. Another way that got me to the same uh, result right, was more heuristic in nature. I just uh, postulated some initial state, what, which was a well-defined momentum state, and took a look at what the vertices operator, say this is an operator calculated at Z, and let's take the annihilation part of it, right? And, and I, I just looked at what was the effect of this annihilation acting on this external leg, and I, I got something like that, which then I have shown that once I integrate over Z with all the other exponentials that could involve Z, I got the total momentum conservation for, for the diagram, the whole diagram. Right, the momentum conservation for all the external legs. Right? Since we don't have LFZ reduction formula for fermions, I could just write it. Right? 
But again, without proving, we just uh, it gets even more complicated than the one for scalars, right? And you don't get much because you don't gain much because we I'm not really proving those those formulas. So I'll leave the reduction formula for fermions for later when I prove the LSZ reduction formula. For now, let's do the fermions in this way, heuristically. We can get to the Feynman rules, which are the true ones, in the limit of um, three level, right? When I can uh, just forget about Z's and, and modifications to the mass that will come from loops later, right? So let's take a look at that. So now what I want to to think is about a, a fermionic state, uh, one of these asymptotic fermionic states. I know that for the free theory, I can write a fermionic state of momentum P and spin S, right? This S is that index for the solutions of the, the Dirac equation. Huh? In this way, right? It's the normal uh, uh, relativistic um, normalization and a creation operator acting on the vacuum. And this is the new index, right? Other than that, this would be just the same creation operator for, uh, for scalars, right? There's only two differences here. One is the index and another one is the anti-commutation relations that these guys satisfy, right? That means that Psi acting on this state can be written as the integral of d3 p prime over 2 pi cube 1 over square root of 2 e p prime sum over s prime a p prime s prime u s prime p prime exponential of e p prime x acting on this guy right which i can write as square root of 2 e p a s dagger p zero right i wrote only the annihilation part of psi because that's what contracts with this with this initial state there's also another part b dagger that could create a completely different state on the vacuum. That's not what I'm interested in, right? I'm interested on, on this state, on, on the initial, uh, in the distant past, right? Again, I have a very similar situation with the, that I had with the scalar, right? This guy, I can commute with this one. There'll be a delta, direct uh, delta on the momentum coming from that. There'll be a Kronecker delta on the spin coming from that, on this index S uh, coming from that, and then, then I can use the Dirac to integrate on momento. I can use the S, uh, the Kronecker delta on S prime S to do the sum, right? In practice, I convert every, every prime to their non-prime counterpart, and then this square root conceals with this one, and, and I am left only with a very short expression, which is the exponential of E I P X times U of S. Remember, S prime becomes S because of a Kronecker delta when I commute this guy with that one, right? P, and that's acting on zero. Of course, the anti-commutator gives me this result, right? I will have the anti-commutator of P prime S prime A P S dagger minus the opposite, right? And this is zero acting on zero, right? Because there's an annihilation operator. So I don't have to worry about this part. It's only that. So you see that I have something, some part which is very similar to the scalar. I know what happens to this guy. X here will be the position of some vertex, right? Because I'm bringing an external state. What I'm thinking is I have an initial state with momentum P, spin state specified by S, right? 
and that's going to a vertex, right? There could be other things here in this vertex, right? But the operator in this vertex, this one, is annihilating this state, and there are other operators in this vertex which are creating other states. That's why I only took the annihilation part of this guy here, right? The leftover from that annihilation is an exponential. This exponential, once I integrate on x, will give me momentum conservation on this vertex, right? But there's something else. This is new. This is something that, in the case of the scalar, was not there. And again, it is expected, because this is the function that specifies the uh, spin state of this incoming particle, right? So these are new uh, Feynman rules. Let me spell them out uh, carefully here. So what I'm saying is that suppose I have external line and this external line has two parameters, P and S. Right? And P is oriented in the same direction as these thing here, right? When I get to a vertex that in Yukawa interaction will include another fermion and a scalar, but I don't care about this part, I'm really writing the rule for an external leg now. Remember that when I did the scalars, I put a rule for an external leg and I said, this is trivial, that's just the number one, but I'm keeping this in place so we don't forget. Here is where that is not one anymore. There is a complicated spinner in there. And I'm saying I'll put in my Feynman rules a US of P when I see an external lag that involves momentum P and, and, um, and spin S. Right? I could do the same calculation, but instead I'll put that on, on the exercise list. Right? But I could do the same with a different initial state, right? I could do the same calculation, but put an initial state that has momentum P, uh, spin S, but which I indicate somehow like this to say this is the antiparticle, not the particle, but the antiparticle particle coming with momentum P and spin S, right? In this case, it's not A that would annihilate this guy, but it would be B, P line, S line, that would annihilate this guy, not A, right? That means that the field I could, I, I, I have to act here to annihilate this guy is Psi bar, because Psi does not contain B, only B dagger. It's Psi bar that contains B dagger, right? But other than that, the idea is the same, right? I would have the same result, but instead of U, I would get a V bar, right? So then the rule would be something like that. Let me remove the arrows for now, right? And we'll discuss the arrows in a second. Right? What I'm saying is th there's still a particle. It's not an anti-particle because it's annihilated and created by B, right? But with the same momentum and spin. And I'm saying that if I do that, I'll have to contract Psi bar with PS. Let's call it that bar, just to remember this is the antiparticle, right? And what I would get here is V bar S P, right? Just because I have V bar here instead of U. The rest of the calculation looks pretty much the same, right? Uh, but with Bs instead of As and V bar instead of U. But again, also, since I know it's a psi bar acting here, remember my convention, they, these lines, these oriented lines, they go out of psi bars and they go in psi, right? And that's a good way, I mean, to, to remember what's an antiparticle uh, is to use the convention that for antiparticles, we will orient momentum in the opposite sense of this, because this, uh, arrow is really showing the flow of uh, quantum numbers, right? So 
if it is charge, if you want to think of charge, the particle will be carrying an opposite charge than an antiparticle. So if they are both moving that way, charge will be moving in opposite direction, right? If you're moving negative charge to the right, it's the same as moving positive to the left. Right? So these arrows really indicate the flow of quantum numbers. Right? And that keeps the convention for the external lines the same as for the internal line. So you know that if you see a line coming from minus infinity in time into a vertex, it has to act, be acted upon by a psi bar to annihilate that particle. Right? So you know it's an antiparticle and you keep the convention for this flow. So that's how you indicate particles and antiparticles. I could do the same to the left, right? I could say now there's a particle leaving a vertex, right? And going to the future, right? I know that the guy that creates this is psi bar, right? Because psi contains a, and psi bar contains a dagger, right? So this needs to be created by a psi bar acting on the vertex, and that means that when I draw this diagram, here's the vertex. And then there's my particle going to the future, right? Again, I'll always orient, orient momentum and spin the same way. Right? I prefer to do it that way. Since this is created by a psi bar in this point, right? I know there will be not V, but U bar. Because that's the part proportional to a dagger in psi bar. And if this is like that, <coughs> you get Vs of P because I'm creating this antiparticle with the a, B dagger part, which is in Psi. Right? And it's proportional to V and not V bar. Right? So these are all the rules for the external fermionic lines. Right? This is new. For the scalar, the external lines were trivial. It was just the number one. But here I have these uh, functions, right? which by the way, also carry a spinor index. Right? So if I go back just a little bit, you have to remember that this, uh, this um, field that is acting on the vertex here, to, the first vertex this field touches, right? this external leg touches, right? has an index gamma that is here. right? This is a spinner with index gamma. This is uh, carried by this function mu. Right? So that means that it can also specify, remember that there was an index for the vertex where this guy is going in, right? All these fields will have right, this uh, index here. So you end up with these functions as multiplicative factors in your matrix element. And then you can look later where these indexes is, are contracted, right? That will depend on the rest of the diagram, right? Uh, but you can easily, if you carry these indexes explicitly, then see where they'll get contracted and where you, how you can write these as a proper matrix uh, product. Right? But the important point is that you have these, you remember, indexes at the vertex. Well, so now I want to call your attention to a few subtle points, right? So this is clear for, uh, the situation is clear when I have just one fermion at the start or one fermion at the end, but it can get subtle if I have two fermions, especially uh, if they are the same, right? They are the, the, um, indistinguishable because if I have two states, let's write it like that, P, S, and another one, P prime, S prime, and suppose they are undistinguishable. So they are either 
both the particle or both the antiparticle. Right? Let's assume the particle just for simplicity. Right? Then these will have to be annihilated at s somewhere in the diagram by two applications of psi. Doesn't need to be the same point. Could be z1 and z2. Right? Doesn't matter. But that's what needs to happen. You need an operator here to annihilate this guy and another one to annihilate that one. Right? But let's suppose I do the annihilation like this. This guy is, anni is annihilating this one. This one is annihilating that. Right? It's obvious that if I do the opposite, right, there will be a minus sign. Right? If I take this other pairing this guy annihilating that one and this one annihilating this one I'll get a minus sign because you know I'll have to write this guy as two A daggers acting on the vacuum I already chose a convention for how to do this I do it in the same order that is written here but then, in order to do the annihilation, I must make the A's that are coming from the Psi to, meet, to commute with these A daggers. And the number of commutations that I have to do in this option and in this one is different, right? It's, it's different by one, in fact. I just have to reorder these guys and do the first commutator here and then the second one, right? Anti-commutator. So there's an overall minus sign between these guys. That means that if I exchange, if I have two diagrams that contribute to the same matrix element, there will be a, a, a relative sign between them, right? So it, let's suppose I take a, a matrix element which is proportional to these two diagrams, just to make it uh, explicit, right? just to give you a concrete example. Take this one. They are exchanging a scalar. And let's think about the final states. I did here for the initial state, but the same is true for the final one. Let's think about this. Momentum P3, momentum P4. So I'm saying I contracted P3 with this vertex, Z1, and I contracted P4 with the vertex Z2, right? in this case. Let's do the opposite. Take this diagram and now change the contraction. Now I'm saying I'm contracting P3 with vertex P4 with vertex Z1 and P3 with Z2. Let me rotate a bit to avoid the cross. So I'm doing that now. P3 is down here, P4 is up there. We usually draw this kind of permutation in this way to keep P3 in the same position and make clear that we are uh, exchanging. We do it normally like that. But I want you to realize that what I did is this, right? I took P3 and contracted on Z, uh, Z2 and took P4 and contracted on Z1. So essentially I'm doing exactly what I'm doing here. But instead in here, I, I, I did it for this initial state in here, I'm doing to for the final state. Right? So you could uh, just imagine the same thing like that, right? To, to the left, right? the same two combination. Okay, so what I'm saying is, since the only change I'm doing is exactly something like that, there will be a minus overall sign, uh, a minus relative sign. But you could ask me, right? You could say, but is this guy the positive one and this guy the negative one or the other way around, right? And it's not easy to see that from Feynman diagram. In fact, that depends on the convention, that depends on how I order these fermions at the start, that depends if I have other fermionic fields right here that are contracting with other particles. Right? That depends on, on a lot of stuff. The only way to really know the overall sign of a, of a matrix element is to do Vick's theorem. You really have to write in some convention and, and contract everything and look. 
which sounds bad. It sounds like there's information that I cannot get from Feynman diagram. But the point is, I never care or almost never care uh, about the overall sign of M because what goes in the cross section is the modulus square of M. Right? So I, I'm very rarely interested in the absolute sign of M. So knowing that permutations like that lead to relative minus signs is enough for me. I can just define one of them to be positive and put the other one negative. And I know that once I take the square of it, there will be negative interference between them. And if there was no uh, overall uh, relative sign, they would interfere constructively, right? So this is an amplitude. I, I worry about the modular square of that. The one exception we'll see later is when I'm trying to compare this with the non-relativistic limit, right? Trying to extract potentials from Feynman diagram. Then the, the absolute sign is important because it will be the sign of the potential. And we'll see how to find the proper sign when we get to that problem. But for relativistic scatterings, which is what this theory does, right? Uh, you, don't, you don't care. So you don't need to somehow find a general rule for the absolute sign. You, it's enough to know the relative one. Another place where this kind of relative sign shows up is when I exchange particles by antiparticles. Let's see an example just to make it definite. So rem imagine uh, a situation where I'm doing some cross section of a particle. Let's, let's make the particle the negative guy. So it's a fermion with negative charge is the particle and the fermion with positive charge is the antiparticle. And this is going to F plus F minus. A real world example of this is what is called Baba scattering, where the electron is this uh, negative fermion and the positron is the positive one. So this appears on a, a real uh, scattering that we calculate. Uh, we'll calculate this eventually. I don't, I don't want to do Baba scattering now. Toga do this example in my lecture notes for Baba scattering. I don't want to do it now because we still didn't talk about the electromagnetic interaction yet. Right, so I'll do it for Yukawa interaction. So assume we have this uh, fermion and antifermion and they scatter, right? This will come from a matrix element that looks like F minus F plus two uh, vertices, right? You have to trust me that you cannot do this in Yukawa with just one vertice, with just one vertex, but you can try to, to, to come up with a Feynman diagram that does that, you won't find one, right? So it goes through these two vertices. Let me call this one Y. And you have final state, which is, in fact, this is the final state, the initial state is F minus F plus, right? And let's give um, momentum to this guy. So this guy will get P1, this guy will get P2, this guy will get P3, and this guy is getting P4. Right? I'm trying to get the same conventions as my nodes. Right? The scalar fields don't matter much. right? Since there's no scalar particles at the start nor at the end, these guys need to contract amongst themselves. Every other combination will be zero because either you have A acting here or A dagger acting there. So the only term that will survive is the contraction of these two guys, right? So this thing becomes, after I contract the scalar, becomes just this, right? I can remove the phi's from here, right? And keep everything else. Right? Now I have to decide how these fields that are acting on both of these uh, vertices, I lost P3 and P4 on the copying, right? How these guys act on to, to annihilate these initial states and create the final ones, right? That's what needs to happen. The initial particles need to disappear and, and, and appear, and, and the final ones need to appear, right? So what I want you to, to realize, there's 
two ways of doing that. Because think about this guy. This guy can annihilate F minus, or it can create a F plus. So it can create the state that is at the end here, or it, or it can annihilate the one at the start, right? And this guy can do the same. So, so I need to decide which one does which, right? And, and so let's think about one possible contraction. Let me copy this over here because I'll do the other contact, contraction later. Let's think about the, the option when this is that guy that annihilates F minus here, right? So this guy needs to create, let me use the same ordering I did in the notes. This order, you, you realize, uh, I want you to, to pay attention, right? When I change this order, there's a minus overall sign for the diagram. And that's why this, this overall sign cannot matter, because this is a matter of convention. I'm saying there's two states at the end, but if I exchange them here in my, the, the start of my calculation, I'm exchanging the overall sign of the matrix element that cannot be important the sign of this amplitude right so i'm just making the same convention as my notes here so i put f minus to the right on this guy right so if i use if this guy is annihilating this i need this one to create p3 there so let me put a line there once i choose one i have no no freedom for the other right and let's make it so that this, this guy is the opposite, right? It creates F plus or annihilates, uh, um, it annihilates F plus or creates F minus. So let's say I'm using this guy to annihilate F plus at the start and using this guy to create F minus at the end. So with those constructions, the diagram I have in mind is this, right? I have a point X, I have a point Y, right? These two points for the vertex, right? I said there's a propagator, a scalar propagator going to from X to Y, right? And I'm saying that momenta, momentum P1, which was a particle, right? Goes into Psi, was going to Y. So there's P1 going here. P1 is oriented in this direction. I'm saying P2 is going also into Y, right? but since P2 is an antiparticle, I have this arrow here, right? P2 is still going in that direction, but I have an antiparticle. And the other two momenta are coming out of X, right? Point X. So I have two lines coming out of X, Right? One for a particle, which has momentum P4. Actually, P4 is the antiparticle. But when I went from here to here, I remade the convention and forgot to exchange the, the momentum, right? So, following my initial assignments of momenta and the lecture notes, I assign P4 to the antiparticle and P3 to the particle. So there's an antiparticle with P4 coming out and the particle with P3, right? So that's, that's what I get from this particular contraction. We usually, we usually don't draw this diagram like that because this is the annihilation of particle antiparticle, right? They are going in the same point all the energy is transferred to the scalar field and then transferred back to the fermion field, right? So this is the annihilation of particles followed by pair production. But this, uh, the way of I, I, that I, I draw the diagram is irrelevant, right? They, we usually draw it like that. I want to keep it like that because it makes the symmetry I'm trying to explore more obvious, right? Let's see about the second possibility of contraction. Now, I will still keep this here, right? So I'm not changing anything in how the Psi is being contracted. So this guy is still going to P4 and this is still going to P1. But let's exchange these two, 
right? Let's uh, make it so that this guy, Psi bar, is the one doing what this guy did before. So Psi bar will create F minus. And Psi bar, this Psi bar in X, is what annihilates F plus at the start. Right? Notice that here, when I, I use these guys to annihilate this one, then these two annihilate this, these two annihilate this, and these two annihilate this, right? I never uh, uh, reordering fermions, so I get no sign. In here, though, let's suppose I start with this contraction. Fine, no sign. Then I want to do, say, this which would be the second I do here, right? I have to go over one, two fields, right? This guy's already gone, right? So this is just a plus. But then I want to act with this guy on the left and this guy on the right. So I have to exchange the order of these two. So that gives me a minus sign, right? In comparison with this one, they started all with the same uh, convention, right? But now I got a, a, a relative sign between these and that, given the same convention, right? So what I'm saying is that now I have this contraction that I've written here, right? That let, let me draw the diagram. So I still have point X and point Y. I still have a scalar going between them. That didn't, did not change, right? But now I have P1 going to Y, which is the same I had here, but let me draw it like that. P1 is going in that direction, right? Uh, to Y, but P2 is going into X, right? So this antiparticle here is now going into a different point. Right, and uh, and now P three is coming out of Y, which is different from before. So P three is now going in that direction, and P four is now here. So you see, it's a different diagram, and actually physically different, right? Instead of the particles annihilating transferring all their energy into the scalar field, and then the scalar field decays into a pair of fermions. Now, I, I, I'll, I just exchange a scalar. Some part of the momentum and energy goes here, but it's never, never all the energy is contained in the scalar field, right? It's just a particle scattering antiparticle, right? And what I'm seeing from this logic here Right? when I have to exchange the order of these two guys to do the second contraction, I see that these two diagrams have a different sign. They have a relative sign to each other. And the way, of course, that, uh, uh, that whole logic is kind of hard to remember, right? It seems like the only way of seeing this uh, relative sign is to do the Vick theorem, which is what I'm doing here. But it's actually not like that. You can think that you can go from this diagram by exchanging uh, a particle by an antiparticle, right? So let me color these, these things. Maybe that will make it uh, more clear. Let me remove all of these labels. And compare just the diagrams. So you see that looking at them like that, you could think that you can go from this diagram into that one by taking this antiparticle here and moving to the other vertex and taking the green one here and moving to the vertex down. That's exactly what happened in terms of co contractions. But you could also think that you rotated this line into the past here and this one into the future. So you're exchanging at each vertex one particle by an antiparticle. Right? You can see that this diagram, if I fold this green line out here, it will go into the red one, and the red one out here will go into the green. If I just do one of them, 
they do not interfere because now the initial and final test states are different. So I need to do it in a way that I still have the same initial and final state. But if I can do that, just take a particle into an antiparticle and vice versa here to get the other diagram, they will have a overall minus sign between them. That means this diagram, which is the annihilation diagram, interfere with that one negatively. Right? And that happens also in the Bible scattering. In the Bible scattering, I just exchange this scalar by a photon here. Right? We'll see that later once we quantize the photon. Right? We didn't yet. Now, just to give a very simple example of how to use fermionic rules to, to calculate a diagram, let's look at this diagram. This is a very simple example, but... Uh, you gain much more trying to do the more complicated ones. This is just to illustrate how uh, uh, how the indexes contract and, and things like that. So I'm thinking about a particle with momentum P1 and let's say spin R. I have to specify this state, right? And an antiparticle with momentum P2 and spin S annihilating each other and producing two scalar particles which will come out with momentum P4 and P3. Right? Can't, can't be much simpler than that, right? As, I, as always time in our diagrams is implying as going to the right. Let's calculate I M with the Feynman rules we have shown above. Right? So the first thing we is to write the rules for their external legs and propagators, right? There's no scalar propagator, only external legs for the scalars, which don't contribute anything, right? Remember, I'm calculating uh, the Feynman rules for these, right? Which is already uh, after the application of LSZ, so there's no propagator for the external lines, right? And I have only one propagator for fermions and external lines for fermions, which matter. Let me write the external legs for fermions following a particular direction, right? Which is maliciously uh, chosen at random by me, right? Let's follow the opposite direction of this flux. Let's start with this guy, then write this guy, then write this one. So this is the first one. This is an anti-fermion coming from the past and going into this vertex, right? If you go back to the rules, let's go back. Right. This is this rule, right? Anti-fermion going to this vertex. This is a V bar that goes into the rules. So I need to put here a V bar of P2 because that's his momentum. His spin is S, right? And uh, there's a uh, uh, spinner index that is associated with this vertex. Let's call it alpha for now. Right? Let's call it alpha. Then there is this propagator. This propagator is a fermion propagator. There's some momentum going in here. Let me call Q and orient it down. I could orient it up. It's all arbitrary, right? But this guy is not free. He's fixed by momentum conservation on either end here. Let's use the upper one and, and write this guy as P1 minus P3. I won't write P1, P3 here, but it is implied. When I write Q, I'm really writing P1 minus P3, right? And that means that propagator goes from here to here, right? In momentum space, that means I have a U, Q slash plus M over Q square minus M square plus I F. Sorry, remember what I have down here is P1 minus P3 square. What I have up here is P1 slash minus P3 slash, right? It's much sh shorter to just write Q, right? In terms of spinner indexes, right? I know that this guy goes from here to here, so I, I need to, to give a spinner index to this vertex. Let's call it beta. So this is the propagator that goes from beta to alpha, so it's the element alpha beta. And then I write the rules for this guy. This is a f uh, not an anti-fermion going in, it's the fermion. 
if you go back to the rules, that's a U uh, of P1, which is its momenta, of R, which is its spin, right? U R of P1. And again, I have an index, which now I have already named is beta. There's nothing for the scalars, there's no symmetry factors, there's nothing else, right? That's pretty much just it, right? Now see the order I choose, right? By choosing walking backwards in this line, these guys came out at an order that alpha is contracted with alpha, beta is contracted with beta. So this is really already ordered in a way that I can write as a matrix product between these guys, right? So it was not by random that I choose that direction, right? If you follow the opposite direction of these lines, you get matrix product. Remember, closed lines of fermions, we, we have seen for the loop, give traces, which is, again, consistent what I'm doing. If I go the opposite way, eventually I go around and I get a trace, right? Uh, and this is always true. You can see this is already, always true. But if you don't remember that, it doesn't matter either. These guys would be in the wrong order. But if you're writing the, the spin or index explicitly, right? In the end, you know how to order them, right? If this guy was, I had written this guy first, it would be here. But then I see that beta is here. So the matrix product is there. So this is the matrix element, right? I need to calculate M square, but that has a lot to do with what I do with these, these uh, indexes, right? How do I specify spin for scatterings of fermions? Do I always need to specify uh, spin? That's the next thing we will discuss, right? But for now, we have the matrix element. And nicely enough, you see this ends up not being a matrix in the end, right? All the spin or indexes are contracted. So this is a number, a complex number. Right? That depends on these indexes, but it's not a, a, a proportional to a gamma matrix, a direct matrix anymore. Okay, now I want you to imagine the following, right? We, we have these diagrams for scatterings of fermions, and I still have to specify the spins, right? This is useful in some very specific situations where you can prepare initial states which are, which have polarized beams somehow. So you manage to align the spins of the initial particles in some direction, right? And you're using detectors at the end that are actually measuring those spins, right? You can do that in some uh, cases, but that's not by far the most common situation. Right? The most common situation is that your beam is whatever it is, you're just throwing protons and you're not doing anything to align their spins anywhere. And you're measuring them with detectors that are mostly just gathering energies, right? Uh, just uh, They're just looking at how these guys curve under the, uh, an external magnetic field, but they are moving at, at uh, energies which is are too high for you to be able to measure spin, right? So the most general case, you're not, you don't know how the initial particle is polarized and you don't know how the final one is, right? And in fact, if you think about it, right, what happens is that from the initial state, since you don't know, right, you can safely say that if you're, unless you're being got polarized by accident, well, let's suppose you're, you're making an experiment that does not cause this polarization, right? That the probability of your initial particle being polarized up is, and that's true for each of those particles, right? Is the same as it being polarized down. That, that's the definition of what, of what means that your beam isn't polarized. And this probability is 50%. Right? So what I'm saying is that half the particles, any direction that I choose, right, I'll have a probability of half, and I decide to measure uh, spin in some direction, the projection of spin in some direction, I'll have 50% of chance of measuring it up or down in this initial beam, right? 
So that's what means to say my being in a, is unpolarized, right? Also, since I'm not measuring my the polarization of the final particles, right? One, once I see a, 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 a particle at some particular region, right? So I'm talking about not probability. I'm writing probability, but it's really probability density. Let's take a small uh, slice of the phase space, and I see a particle there. Right? The total probability of getting a particle in that slice will be the probability of giving an initial state. It's going to spin up in that slice, plus the probability of going into that same slice with spin down. Right? Since I'm not measuring spin, right? the probability is the sum of these two. Right? I don't care if it's up or down, I just sum the two options of a final state. Right? If I use these two things together, right, I see that the probability of giving some initial state going into a spin up after the scattering right, will be half the probability of it, it starting at up going into up plus half the probability of it starting down and finishing up, right? Because I had half, 50% uh, chance of initial being up and 50% of initial being down, right? And that means that the total, this is P total, right? That means that the total probability or probability density, I still have to integrate over phase space and all that, all that jazz, right? But will be half probability up going up plus half of down starting down going up plus half the probability of up going down plus half of down going down and i need to do that for each fermion for each fermion. So essentially, what I'm saying is that I'll, in this case, right, I'm scattering one fermion and I'm forgetting the rest of the calculation, right? Suppose this fermion is scattering on an external field or on a scalar, so I only have spin on this guy, right? The final probability will be the average of the sum over SR where S and R can both go up or down, they have two possible values of P from S going to R, right? So I'm averaging over the spins of the initial formulas and summing over, that's why there's only a one power half here is for the S, right? And summing over the final spin, right? This is more general than it sounds, right? This is true for any quantum number that I'm not looking at. So quarks, for instance, quarks have color. We'll see that eventually. But quarks have color, three colors. That means that I have to average over colors of the initial quarks if I'm not observing color, which I'm never observing, right, in real world experiments, right? And summing over the colors of the final quarks, if I'm not observing that too, which is, again, true, always for, for quarks, right? So remember that I always average over these quantum numbers or state possibilities that I don't observe at the start, and I'm summing over them in the final states, okay? So now, in, in, in practice, this is very useful, right? Because uh, given the, the Feynman rules um, that I wrote above, my matrix element will contain objects like U of S, P, V, bar of S, P, and so on, right? You have some guys like that in your matrix element, right? When you take the square of that, you get these guys, again, the complex conjugate of them, actually, the dagger. And then see what happens. I know from my normalization condition that this guy, 
actually let me do the calculation here, right? For S equal one or two, right, of USP, U bar S, P, right, will be the sum over S. And I'm, I'm writing now these guys explicitly, right, of these, square root of P times sigma, remember this is the explicit form of these guys in, in uh, arbitrary uh, reference frame, P scalar sigma bar psi of S times, this is uh, uh, one by two, right? So it's, it's just psi S dagger, square root of P sigma, and it's a two component object, but it is uh, a line, not a column, right? square root of p times sigma bar. All of that multiplied by gamma zero, right? Which in our representation is just zero, one, one, zero, like that, right? So I can do this, right? This product, it's pretty easy. Since, notice, I'm multiplying this, not as a proper contraction, this will be, become a matrix, right? And the matrix will be this one P sigma psi S psi S dagger P sigma bar P sigma psi S psi S dagger P sigma bar and very similar thing here without the bar and a very similar similar thing here with a bar over here. All right, let me just check. There's also a bar here, All right? And that pretty much settles it, All right? So this is a four by four matrix because these are two by two matrices, right? And remember, I have a normalization condition for psi, which is that the sum over S, and that's what the sum means important, right? Psi S, psi S dagger is just the identity in two by two, right? So since I'm summing over S, all these size go away right and then i have to do the product of these uh poly matrices here and i can use and that i won't prove uh, but please take a look at my lecture notes if you if you want to check this but you can you can check it yourself it's not hard to show that this times this one Right, which appears here and here, right, is just uh, p mu p mu, which you know we know it's m square because these are these are the momenta of a final or initial state particle, which is on shell, right? So p mu p mu is m square, right? And and that means I can rewrite this matrix as So I have M, because I have this uh, um, the square root, right? So I have the square root of this product, right? Here, I just get this matrix times itself. It's just P sigma. Same here, P sigma bar, right? Understood that this M is multiplying the identity in two by two, right? So it's a diagonal matrix proportional to M there, and same here, right? Which I can easily rewrite. Right? If you remember that sigma mu in our uh, convention is sigma mu 
gamma mu is sigma mu sigma mu bar, right? Which are here, right? This part is just p slash, right? It's p time p mu times gamma will give me this thing away from the diagonal, and this on the diagonal is just m times the identity now in four by four, right? But which we usually just leave it. We just leave like that. So what I what I what I have just shown right is that uh, the sum over s u s p u bar s e is equal to p slash plus m. You could have done the same for v v and write v s p v bar s p is equal to p slash minus m right? and these two are very useful relations because they will once i average or sum over spins they will appear in the matrix element square right when, which is what i really used in in cross sections for Fermi. just to see what you get from this let's go back to our simple example that I did just a few minutes ago. Let's take this guy, right? And copy this. And see what happens if I try to calculate uh, uh, some part of the probability density uh, without knowing the spins, right? So let me take first this expression where I already order this guy as a product of uh, product of um, gamma matrices. I don't care about this i epsilon anymore because q will not be m anyway. We'll see that q square is not m square anyway, so I'm not going through the pole here. We'll see that later right, when we look at channels. Right? But uh, for now, what I want is to rewrite this guy as v dagger s p2 gamma zero that's what v bar means right and repeat the rest right now the these little product symbols here means a product of matrices in this spinner uh, space right now i want to calculate this guy right to do that first i take minus i m star and since M is a number, you see all the matrices are contracted here with vectors at the end. So this is really a number in spinor space. So that means that this is the same as a dagger here, right? For this guy, which is a number, right? But that means I can apply the dagger in there. So I get U dagger R P1, right? Here, the dagger will only act on the gamma mu that is here. So I can write this as minus i q dagger plus m, right? This is just the identity in four by four. So it's the dagger is the same uh, over q square minus m square, gamma zero dagger uh, v s of p2, right? Just took the dagger of this whole expression, right? The, the complex conjugate, right? Gamma zero in our representation is the same as gamma zero dagger, right? And now I want to bring gamma zero over here so that this guy becomes U bar, right? I can go over this matrix, this mass, because this is just proportional to the identity. So gamma zero can come over here, but no, not over here, or not over this guy. To go over this guy, I can use two properties. First, that gamma zero square is one. So I can just multiply gamma zero square on this side, right? And, and then I know that gamma zero, gamma mu dagger, again in our representation, right? Is gamma mu, right? So I can absorb the gamma mu to the left of this guy and the right of this guy in here and eliminate the dagger, right? Easily. And of course, the, the, with the mass, there's no problem because gamma zero comes here and gamma zero square is, is zero. So 
in practice, when I go over with the gamma zero, I remove I remove this dagger, right? And write just uh, u bar r p one. Uh, these I just repeat and remove this dagger, and this is just v s of p two, right? Let me just check it for missing signs. Or that's fine, right? That means if I multiply these two guys, then I get the ele matrix element modulus square, right? Which will be the product of this. Right, which is a number, a product of many uh, matrices, but it, it is a number times this one. Okay, so far so good. Now I want to make these indexes explicit. You'll see pretty soon why I need that. Right, so let me call this alpha, let me call this alpha beta. I'm going to call this beta. I put beta here just to be consistent. Remove these symbols. Right? Uh, same here, I'll call this guy. Let me keep notation rho, rho, sigma, and sigma. Right? Now that I can now I can reorder those guys without a problem. Right? And then think about it. Right? My total cross section, polarized cross section, will depend. On the polarization of these initial fermions. Remember, I'm thinking about a case where I'm throwing a fermion and an anti-fermion at each other, and I get two scalars at the end. That's what I'm calculating here. Right? And so R is the polarization of one of these guys, and S is the polarization of the other. Right? So my cross-section depends on S and R, right? And will be some integral over phase space, let's call it this D phase. Right? Of this guy. Right? There's a lot here. There's momentum conservation. There's all of that. But um, it's a conservation of this guy. And the total cross section, right, as I just argue, will be the average over the initial spin of one of these guys, the average over S, times the, uh, and the average over R. Right? So I have a sum over S, a sum of R, R and a power one fourth of this sigma sr, which means that I can rewrite this as the phase, the integral phase space, times one-fourth of the sum over s and r of the matrix element. Right? Let's calculate this guy. Right? I can always go and, and integrate over the phase space later, but the important thing is these guys goes right through the phase space because the spin is not included in energy nor linear momentum conservation. Right? So this goes all the way to the M. That's the only place where the spins can show up. Right? And this guy now, right? One fourth over the sum over uh, one fourth of the sum over S, the sum over R of modulus m square is that sum applied here right but now i can use these relations up here right i can come over here and take the sum over s and use on the u pair and the sum over v on the v pair let me copy these two expressions because we'll have to use them down there right let me put them over here in the corner, right? They'll be useful here, right? Let's think about the U first. So I have a sum over R, which is fine, is here, right? P1 is the same, right? Like in this expression. And I have these indexes, right? Beta and rho. So this, according to this formula, is just uh, P1 slash plus m, right, beta rho. Pay attention to the order, right? This is u, u bar, right, with different indexes. So it is a matrix 
as expected because of this p1 slash let me try to write beta and rho in a proper way here right i can do the same for v so v is here v bar is there that will give me p2 slash minus m right and now the indexes are in the order that you have here is v v bar so i, I had to bring this v over here it's no problem because now there's no Grassmann numbers anymore, and this is the the uh, the matrix element, right? So I can commute then. Right? This will be the element sigma alpha of this matrix. It's very important to mind the order of these indexes, right? So now I, I'm done with spin. S and R have both disappeared from here, right? I can just copy the rest, right? I, I'll just copy. Well, this i goes away with its minus i. I can copy this guy uh, over here, this one over here, and I have one over, oops, one over q squared minus m squared squared. Remember, q is just a combination of p1, p3, p1 and p3, actually. And this expression is, is, is really nice. I, I forgot the factor four, right? So I have a factor four here, this four. And I think that's all I forgot. Yeah. So now look at this, right? Look at the indexes. I can now reorder these guys to make matrix product, right? So beta rho, rho, rho is here then sigma sigma is here i can i can actually write but if you really look at the the indexes you see there's a closed uh, loop here right again a trace right so what i'm saying and now let's write that trace carefully is that this expression is just 1 over 4 q square minus m square square and the trace Let's start with this guy. I can start with any of them, right? Because it's a trace, it's cyclic. P1 slash plus M, beta rho. Then I go rho here, Q slash plus M, rho sigma. Sigma is here. So the next one is P2 slash minus M, sigma alpha. Alpha is there. Q slash plus M, alpha beta that goes back to the start. And that's my expression. Right? So, two very important things here. One, this is a good example now that when you go to integrate on phase space, there will be angle, right? There will be dependence on angles because I have scalar products between these many momenta here. The angle between the momenta will be important. Here, because you have P1 uh, scalar P2, P1 scalar Q, which is P1 and P3, so the angle between P1 and P3 can matter too. Same thing here when I take Q square, right? There's P1 and P3 in Q. So the angles will play a role here. The second important thing is I have to take the trace of this, which is the trace of the product F of, in the worst case here, four gamma matrices. And that will lead us to a whole machinery on how to calculate the traces of gamma matrices that will look further ahead in the course will be very important to us to be able to efficiently calculate uh, the traces of gamma matrices because that's already the second instance where the trace appears right already it appeared in, in, in when i had loops of fermions and now it's appearing where i sum when i sum over uh, polarization when i don't know the polarizations of the final uh, or the initial, in this case, it's just the initial for me. The next subject I would like to discuss is the idea of uh, Dirac uh, field bilinears. Right? So we, we, you can already understand that since these guys are Grassmann numbers, right? Uh, any any quantity that uh, goes into the Lagrangian, or more more importantly, becomes unobservable, will have to be built of uh, the even part of the Grassmann algebra, right? We don't have, we don't observe Grassmann quantities, right? So uh, that means I'll have to P1 
pick a, a even number of data fields. Right? They will have to come in pairs. We have already seen that uh, the basic uh, bilinear that we, we already used is this one because it's also a Lorentz invariant quantity. Right? So it was very convenient for us to build, for instance, the mass term of the Lagrangian. We have already seen also another bilinear of uh, Dirac fields you know, uh, in, in the form of the kinetic term for Fermions. That's also in the Lagrangian. So it is fitting to ask, and also the Yukawa, by the way, the Yukawa interaction, right, is also built from this same bilinear that I used to build the math. Right. So uh, the question of what, what other bilinears I could build is, is, is important because maybe there are other interactions or other observables that I can build that maybe are not, when, when I built these two guys, I was focusing mostly on the Lorentz property, but maybe I can build other uh, uh, bilinears which have, are not invariant under Lorentz or have more complicated transformations than a vector. That's what this guy has, right? Because this is just del mu. Uh, it doesn't matter where the del mu is applied, but the important part is this, right? This is the bilinear that is in there, right? And this transforms as a vector. Maybe there are other bilinears that transform under more complicated for, uh, ways under Lorentz transformations, but which can be used to build together with other components. Uh, Lorentz invariance quantity and, and could uh, lead to new interaction. You don't know. Right? So now what I want to do is discuss a little bit the properties of these bilinears, see how we can do a systematic categorization of the bilinears, and we'll get in the, in the middle of doing that, we'll get to talk about Fiert's transformations. I'll define that when the time comes. Right? I'll, I'll go a little bit quicker here uh, on the formal aspects, uh, a lot quicker than I went uh, through in my lecture notes. So uh, a lot of the stuff that I'll just uh, enunciate here I, I, is actually proven in the lecture notes. So I refer uh, uh, the interested the student to the notes if he wants to see the proof for some of the things I'll say. Let's start by defining a generic bilinear, right? just some G gamma, which is defining this way, psi bar, gamma, psi, where this big gamma here is just any four by four matrix, right? So this is just any four by four object. Right? And then I can build the basis for all the four by four matrices, which is a space that needs 16 uh, vectors, right? 16 matrices, right? And then I, I can uh, uh, call those elements gamma A, uh, where A goes from one to 16, right? And I can even define an uh, algebra for the matrices in that basis. Which then I can use to even define raising and lowering operators, uh, operation, right, if I want to. Of course, if I use, you, you already see that if I use some version of the Dirac matrices in that basis, this will be the real metric, at least some, uh, subset of this algebra, right, will be the, the um, Clifford algebra, right? I can just compensate with a factor of two in the matrices here and, and get the Clifford algebra in there. But this is more general. So A and B are not, this is not Minkowski, this is just a big, uh, uh, a bigger algebra, right? And then I, I know that any, any, uh, any matrix, right, can be expanded in that basis, right? What I'm calling gamma A, here we'll go from one to 16, A summed over, and these are just numbers, right? These are just coefficients, which are just a number. So 
or have coefficients here, and those are the matrices in that basis. Right? So these are the matrices. Mm -hmm. I can invert this relation to calculate this coefficient. Right? The coefficient, which is a number, is just the trace of m gamma a. I can go back with this expression in here and write everything in terms of its components. Right? So this matrix m component ij. So now I'm using ij to, that go to uh, from 1 to 4. So these guys are running over this 4x4 four four spinner uh, space, right? But, uh, and, and A and B run over all the 16 matrices in that basis for the 4x4 four four matrices, right? So I put this object in here. I have to write a trace explicitly, which is M, L, K, uh, gamma, A, uh, K, L. This is the, this trace, right? And then I have this guy which is gamma A component IJ, because it's the same components on this side and this, right? So this is an expression explicitly in terms of the components, right? It's easy to manipulate these, just appear with some deltas here, and eliminate these matrices. And then you get delta IL, delta JK is equal to gamma A, K L gamma A I J, which is another way to write uh, the algebra for the group, right? I have these uh, products of, of the matrices and, and how they relate, how components of different uh, uh, matrices in that base relate to each other, right? Now let's see how can we use this. Let, let me put this box around this one. And let, let me see how can I use this. Suppose I have a product of two bilinears. Right? Suppose I have psi bar 1, A psi 2, psi bar 3, B psi 4. And this uh, index is 1, 2, 3, and 4. is something that differentiates those fields. So that psi bar is not the same the psi bar here. You could think in the simplest case, this is just the psi bar calculated at point x1, and this is psi bar calculated at point x3, right? That's enough to differentiate them, right? And A and B are just any matrix, right? I can rewrite this uh, in this way, right? Again, putting explicit indexes for the, the um, spinner, uh, components. So I goes from 1 to 4. I have A, A, I, J, Psi 2, J, Psi 3 bar, K, B, K, L, and Psi 4, L. Right? Just writing explicitly the matrix product. Then I know just using these uh, uh, expression that I the product IJ B K L is equal to A A right B B I'm just expanding these guys on on that basis right so A uh, small A and small B are just going from one to sixteen right multiply by gamma A, I, J, gamma B, K, L, right? But now I can, I can rewrite the same product of two bilinears in terms of other matrices. So let's suppose I, I do that. So I just take M psi 2, Psi 3 and Psi 4, right? Actually, let me exchange this. So what I'm trying to do is this. I'm assuming somehow I can rewrite the same product of two bilinears in a different way. I exchange Psi 2 by Psi 4, and now I want to find 
which are the matrices here, assuming I know A and B. I know what matrices I had at the start. Now I want to find M and N. Right? I can, again, do the same I did here, write these explicitly. So Psi1, I, M, I, L. Uh, Psi4, L. Psi3, bar, K, N, K, J. Psi2, J. Right? I'm conveniently choosing the indexes so that the spinners are, are with the same name of index. But this is totally arbitrary, right? These indexes can be exchanged, right? And again, I can also write MIL and NKJ use, uh, using something like that. So MIL NKJ is MC and D gamma C I L and gamma D K J right so again C and D go from 1 to 16 and I want to find the relation between these guys right because then I can effectively make this change right I can rewrite uh, this uh, product here uh, in terms of this one as in terms of a coefficient right so I can write gamma a i j gamma b k l will be equal to some coefficient a b c d right gamma c i l gamma d k j and then translating uh, from one ordering of bilinears to one product of bilinears into this other product of bilinears becomes a, a, in fact the problem of finding the c a b c d right and i can multiply this equation on both sides by appropriate matrices and uh, use the algebra of these bases to write C, A, B, C, D as the trace of gamma A, gamma D, gamma B, gamma C, which solves my problem, right? Essentially, if I know my bases, if I find the appropriate 16 element bases, I can calculate all those traces and know every possible C, A, B, C, D, right? All these coefficients, right? Uh, these formulas together, they are known as the Fiertz uh, reordering formulas, right? Because once I, you know them, you, can't, you can write some products in, of bilinears in terms of other products of bilinears, which is useful because many times you can simplify into bilinears that are easier to work with. But in fact, there's an even more useful uh, relation that comes from the fact that usually the bilinears are already written in terms of matrices of these bases, right? And then you want to translate between some matrices in these bases and some other matrices in these bases. I can get that relation straight from here Right, pretty easily. I just have to write this guy here, right, and use this uh, uh, expression, right. So I just copy the A B and rewrite these two guys like this. Right? Look at that in here, and then remember this is multiplied. Uh, in the expression I, sh I have shown above by psi, psi bar 1 i psi 2 j uh, psi bar 3 k and psi 4 l. So if I multiply this here, what I get is a a b b 
right? And these guys I can just bring around these matrices to, to build the matrix product again. It's Psi 1 bar gamma A, uh, Psi 2, and Psi 3 bar gamma B, Psi 4. And notice the same order, 1, 2, 3, 4, I have here and here, so there's no uh, commutation of, of, of Grassmann numbers there, which is fine. Now, on the right side, I get to copy these, right? Let me get a little bit more space. Leave a copy up there. This be, will be the same as this one, right? And now I have to contract these guys here to make matrix products, right? So, Psi1 goes to the left of this guy, which is fine. Psi1 bar gamma C. Now L is contracted with Psi4 here. So I need to bring Psi4 to the front, which is fine because I go over two other Grassmann numbers. I don't, I don't get any sign. So it's just Psi4. Now Psi2 needs to go to the right of Gamma D and Psi3 to the left. That means I have to uh, commute both. That gives me a sign. And then I can finally write Psi3 bar, uh, gamma d um, psi 2. Hmm? Now, look at these two expressions. I can eliminate uh, for generic a and b, I can eliminate them, and this needs to be true, minus c a b c d psi 1 bar gamma c Psi 4, I'm going to try to copy this guy just to go faster, right? And this is a very important uh, relation called the Firth's identity, right? And, and allows us to reorder products of bilinears, right? And in this case, already the bilinears are written in that basis, which I can always do, right? I can take just a general bilinear expand it first in terms of these bases. I'll have a sum of terms like these, right? And then do uh, use the Fiertz identity to change bilinears, which might not be convenient, into ones that are more convenient. And as long as I know which bases I'm using, I know all these coefficients, right? I know all of them, which is uh, many times useful to simplify uh, expressions we want to use, right? There are more than one ver version of this Fiertz identity. I can write it in many ways. There are some in my lecture notes. I, I won't do them all here. The spirit is always the same, right? Now, the next step is to actually fix a basis, right? We need 16 matrices, right? 16 four by four matrices. I, mean, I could go with the simplest thing, just one, zero, 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 then again, one on the second uh, column of the first line. And, and But those are very hard to work with, right? Uh, since we will have to spend a lot of time uh, uh, studying the algebra of uh, Dirac matrices, I want to build a basis that is written in terms of Dirac matrices and, and, and maybe the identity or a few other uh, matrices, right? And the basis, uh, the, my first, let's say, ansatz for this basis could be something like that, right? So first, the most simple four by four matrices, matrix I can imagine, right? This gives me um, one component for my basis, right? Then, of course, the Dirac matrices themselves, right? I know they are uh, orthogonal to each other, right? So they, they, I can use all four of them. So that's another four uh, matrices. I need 16, right? Then gamma 5. Gamma 5 also uh, anti-commutes with everyone. And so it's, the, again, it's a, it's a good one, right? Then I have gamma mu gamma five, 
which gives me another four matrices. Of course, I have to prove that all of them are linearly independent, but they are, right? I won't prove it. You can find that easily, right? And finally, I'll define a new one, which I'll call gamma nu nu, right? Which is just given by this half of gamma nu gamma nu. So it's an anti-symmetric combination of these uh, these two, right? With many times it's written like that too, like a uh, half of gamma nu gamma nu, and you put a symbol up here to remember this is anti it's the anti-symmetric combination under the exchange of these of these indexes, right? Now I have to count how many matrices I have put here, right? In principle, uh, there should be four uh, uh, four matrices here combined with another three here, but I don't want to do double counting, so I, I divide that by two, right? Because uh, gamma mu nu right is uh, it's not the same a uh, gamma as gamma nu gamma nu but it is minus that so they are not linearly independent i don't want to count both i just want to one, use one of the combinations so in the end i have a total of six matrices six matrices here which is exactly what I needed, right? Now I have here five, five, 10 with six, a total of 16 matrices. This is a basis, right? Of course, I want these to be properly normalized, which is not yet. So you find different conventions for this normalization. I'm following Pesky. And actually he only mentions the normalization he uses at, a, at one exercise, which is this one. So that's what he's using for the basis. And then rigorously, my, my basis will be this one. Let me write it here. Which you can check, right? This is the basis. And you can check that this basis satisfies these, uh, these uh, normalization. The important thing is that whatever your convention might be, right? Once you have a basis like that, you only really have to worry about bilinears with those matrices between the two fermionic fields because now any other uh, any other structure that might appear between between those two fermionic fields can be expanded in this basis and written in terms of the bilinear that are here right just to give a f uh, one or two examples right if you take this guy new new row right and this is defined, again, same notation we use there, is the totally anti-symmetric anti product of these three uh, gamma matrices, right? So you have to build a lot of uh, terms, products between these guys, so that it is completely anti-symmetric. Whatever exchange you make of two indexes here will change the sign, right? It's, it, you can show that this is proportional actually to this new new uh, rho sigma gamma sigma gamma five which is this part of my basis right i can just uh, substitute this guy by by a sum over these four guys with the appropriate sign right uh, same for the totally anti-symmetric combination of four indexes This guy will be proportional, same thing, right? Will be proportional also to epsilon mu nu uh, rho sigma gamma five, right? So it's really directly proportional to one element of my basis. So now all I, all I have to do is write bilinears with all these combinations and I have pretty much everything. In fact, we have names 
for those uh, bilinears and I'll list them here, right? So the simplest thing is gamma equal to the identity. That's psi bar psi. And we call this a scalar. Scalar as a Lorentz, as in Lorentz scalar, right? The second simplest one is when gamma is just gamma 5. And then I get this bilinear, psi bar gamma phi psi. This guy I call the pseudo scalar. And we'll see pretty soon why. It's, it should be obvious just looking at them. This has no uh, Lorentz transformation property. So they should transform the same way under Lorentz transformations. In fact, they do. But they have other transformations in, that make them different. In particular, we have to now look how these bilinears uh, behave under the discrete symmetries that leave the, the, um, uh, the measure of my metric invariant, right? The C, P, and T uh, symmetries. And that's what will differentiate these two guys, and we'll see why this pseudo is there, right? The the other the next one that is very well known to us is this, right? Psi bar gamma mu psi, right? This is a vector for obvious reasons, it's a Lorentz vector, right? And then the next one, gamma, is gamma mu gamma five, another component of that basis. This one leads me to that bilinear, which is called a pseudo vector. For the same reasons, we'll see that this is a pseudo scalar, right? And finally, uh, also sometimes this guy is called the axial vector. Uh, and finally, we have, right, we already got all of these guys, right? Now we, we need these tensor uh, structures here. We depend on two Lorentz indexes. So gamma is gamma mu nu. Sometimes you see these indicated like that. In many books, that's what they use. But it, it means the same sometimes with a factor two between one one notation and another, right? And this is psi bar gamma mu nu psi, which is the anti-symmetric tensor, right? For obvious reasons, right? It, it really transforms as a tensor and it is anti-symmetric by construction. Just to give you a hint on how these bilinears are sometimes connected with important physical quantities. Let's see what happened with this uh, uh, vector bilinear, which I'll call just the vector current. And you see pretty uh, soon why, right? How, how this behaves, uh, assuming this size satisfy the Dirac equation, right? Uh, let me write uh, del mu j mu. And, and apply this derivative here. I get a del mu psi bar, gamma mu psi, plus psi bar uh, gamma mu del mu psi. Hmm? Then I can use uh, uh, Dirac equation both here for that joint uh, field uh, as psi bar del acting to the left, right, is equal to m psi bar, right? And in here I can use, right, this is minus m psi. And then I get m psi bar uh, with, with, uh, sorry, with the gamma included, right? Same here. Is del slash psi, that is minus m psi. So I get m psi bar psi minus m psi bar psi, which is zero, which shows me that this 
uh, vector current is a conserved current uh, for fields that satisfy the, the Dirac equation. On the flip side, if I define now the axial current, which I'll call just um, J mu 5, which is defined as psi bar gamma mu gamma 5 psi, right? So it's, it's based on this bilinear now, right? The axial current. If I look for the continuity equation for this one, will be G, del mu j mu 5, right? Will get me, uh, again, del mu psi bar, gamma mu gamma 5 psi plus psi bar gamma mu gamma 5 del mu psi. Hmm? On this side, I can straight away use the Dirac equation like I did here, right? Let me put this in yellow. So this is m psi bar, right? But on this side, I need to bring the gamma mu over here to use the Dirac equation. That gives me a sign, right? So now I'm getting this sign changes, which changes this sign, right? So instead of having a, 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 a relative minus sign here, I'll have a plus because of this commutation, right? So this will be equal to 2m psi bar gamma 5 psi, which shows me that the actual um, axial current is not conserved unless I have massless fermions. So this is an extra symmetry that is showing up when my fermions go to zero. And it is this conserved current is another, is, is written in terms of another bilinear. So you see these bilinears can be very important. And remember, this will, will be something that will show up in the future that Dirac uh, particles get an extra symmetry when the mass goes to zero, then you have also a conservation of the axial current. This is very important for, especially for QCD, right? Pr plays a central role in understanding QCD. Well, this is all I wanted to cover in this video. And next time we'll talk about the discrete symmetries that leave uh, the Lorentz, the Minkowski measure invariant. The charge conjugation, the parity transformation, and the time reversal, right? And we'll see how these bilinears transform under those symmetries and what kind of Lagrangian will have some of those symmetries or all of them and what kind of uh, effects we can expect from that. So see you next video.